So I switched it out to the pin jaws just so that I don't have the giant jaws flying around at the end of my leg. But honestly, either way is fine because what I'll do if I have the larger set of jaws is I will just grab it right in, in between the jaws on that center area. And that works just as well. It's just you have to watch out for those flying jaws because they're kind of terrifying. Especially if you get your tool in there and it nicks one of the sides. That's scary. Okay, I'm switching to my spindle gouge. Also a Thompson tool. Get it down to round. Okay, this part's important right here. Because if you're doing these things in two pieces, what you need to make sure happens is that, I know, I just, <laughs> I just delegged it. Um, this and that are going to be one piece of wood. This is going to be another piece of wood. So you need to make sure that the diameter at the end of this one, which is this way right now, and the diameter at the end of this one is the same. Okay, that'll give you a nice clean joint when you cut both of them apart and then put them back together so that you don't have one piece that because we're cutting these at an angle, it turns that circle into an ellipse. These ellipses, and we learned that yesterday, if you don't cut them the same or if you don't measure right, you'll have one really tiny thin ellipse and one really fat long ellipse. We don't want that, okay? I always turn with music or podcasts on, so this silence is like, it's freaking me out a little bit. <laughs> I started singing at the Fort Worth Club. What was I doing? Okay. I'm just going to base the second part of the leg on the diameter of this one and hope that they're pretty close to the same or that I don't accidentally have it off center and have this one be way bigger just because the other one's goofed up. Um, but then after you have a true round right here, then you can start moving down the length of the leg. And I usually put the toe right at the end over here. So right now we're starting from the bottom up. And we're starting at that last part of the leg. And I like it to still have a curve. I don't like them to be like straight, super angled tapers. I like it to still have a really, really gradual curve. And it looks like it's got some meat on it. If you want to, it's just got this little foot on it right now. You can part that off or just turn it off at a nice taper. Um, sometimes I do that, and I did that for my example pieces that I have today. Um, but what I would recommend doing first is sanding it a little bit before you do that. That way, if you end up breaking the end of it off, then all you have to do is re-sand that end, not the entire thing when you have no support. Yeah. You get all the dust today. Sorry. Okay, and I just usually start with like a 180 or 120 and then move up to 180. Or maybe this is 220, I don't remember. Okay, so I've got this real quick sanded. Maybe I'll try to actually part this part off or just kind of turn it off. And this little section is gonna break. And I'm okay with that. There we go. Then I can take that sandpaper 
And I like these to be on their tippy toes. So if somebody's not criticizing me on turning too slow, where is he? Talking to you, John. Then I'll actually have time to turn the toe off of these, which is what I usually do anyways. So it's... Hmm? Yeah, it really does. Okay, so we've got this nice cone with a really cool taper. It looks kind of chubby. What am I looking for? I'm looking for this, which I hid from myself. You can pass that around too. Take all the pictures that you want. I'm going to be turning the next section now anyways. Okay, so then with the same, well, I like to put the fat end in the chuck first. So both of the larger ends, I'm just going to put and have those supported in the chuck because that's going to lead to much more support on the spindle as a whole if I leave most of the meat at the base or at the headstock. And you guys can take pictures of all this stuff afterwards, too, if you want. So if you didn't get a chance to or if you felt like you were in a hurry uh, passing the stuff around, take as many pictures as you want later, okay? Okay. What? It is pretty critical, but if you look at it, I only have it turned down to where it's just round past the, past the diameter of the square, I guess. Yeah, as, as close as possible. So I didn't measure it, but I'm pretty good at eyeballing things. <laughs> I can say that now, because I didn't screw up my bowl this time. I do like cherry. Um, two of the legs are cherry, I think. A lot of the stuff that I have is walnut, and I like to ebonize it, and I like to turn everything jet black. Um, but I like cherry for my walnut bowls just because there's some nice contrast. I mean, not a ton of contrast. I still have um, a lot of maple as well that I use. Oh, I didn't pass around my legs for days box. Check out my legs for days. Okay while we're turning this, because I know this is just, it's just spindle turning, but it's for concept. This will give you something to do. And starting at the other side, you guys can figure out how I do the joints. That's the Velcro, so you can rip it apart and put it back together. But yes, I do like cherry. It turns really smooth like butter. But I do a lot of the turning out of walnut. Lots of walnut. Vinegar and steel wool. Yeah. Yes, no, no. Yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> hmm? What is my favorite way of ebonizing? I like to use vinegar and steel wool solution that you just let sit in a jar for about a week and then it's this amazing solution. I've actually got some in my car I could show you if you want. Um, but actually, this. The legs on this piece were ebonized, and then when I was on my way back from Michigan last year, um, a bottle, two bottles actually, red and green, of trans tint dye broke open in my suitcase on the way back. <laughs> so that was fun. <laughs> I spent a couple hours after I got back just cleaning all the trans tin off of everything. But what actually happened, because these were still just legs at the time, it wasn't a finished piece. Um, these legs were in there for my ebonizing demonstration. And they ended up being this weird green-red sheen that just looked awful. 
and I tried to fix it and just wipe over new ebonizing solution. I tried to just clean the legs off of it, but it wouldn't come off. So I just used um, just the black trans tint dye over top of it and it was fine. So that's actually black trans tint dye and ebonizing underneath it. So, And that ended up covering really well too. Um, but it, honestly, it didn't make much of a difference because it just went from black to a blacker black. Yeah, I find that the, hmm? Yeah, some, sometimes it doesn't cover all the way, and then sometimes when you turn it into a certain light, you'll see through the ebonizing to that wood tone. But I, I think it kind of gives it a natural, more animalistic look anyways. <gasps> it's okay, Joel. It's only Velcro. Huh? Yeah, it's only Velcro. Okay, so right now what I'm doing, can you guys hear me with my mask down? Yeah? Okay, what, right now what I'm doing is I'm turning the sections between the joints. So I like to have them very curvy. So I like to turn down and then transition pretty smoothly into the next joint, which is just a very gradual curve. And then on this end is where it's this is where the leg is going to come into the body. So this is where it comes into the body. That's the first joint. This is the middle of the second section. And then this is where it joins with that first leg that I turned. I'm going to sand again. Just warning you. Okay, so this is just my curvy lady without the point. I hope you're not getting my double chin. Okay. <laughs> I don't know where it came from, but I don't think I had this a couple years ago. It probably came from tacos. You guys have better tacos here than you have in Michigan. Just saying. And the barbecue? Oh my god. Okay. Alright, so we've got this section and we've got the other part of the leg. Where'd that go? Thank you. Did everybody see that? The first section that we turned? Everybody over there? Did it ever make it over to the other side of the room? Okay. Okay, so now, this is quite possibly the most crucial part of this project, okay? Some of you would agree. Others think that this is the easiest part and what are you talking about? But everybody can still see this okay, yeah? Yeah, okay. Oh yeah, because videos, duh, okay. All right, so what we need to consider is the angle of the leg. So let's take this one into consideration, which is kind of the one that we are using and get all the other stuff out of the way. I've got two different types of legs here. One of them that sits a little bit taller than the other. You guys see the difference if I lay those over each other? One of them, the toe kicks up a lot higher than the other one. Okay, where could this end up being an issue? Oh, I don't have tape on it anymore. Yes, I do. Where could that be an issue? Or how could that be an issue? Uh, this joint? So it might want to dig into the bowl depending on where you put it and the hip placement. 
All right, what could be another issue that, let's say, this leg has? Depending on hip placement again, it might sit at this angle. It's going to sit on the elbow instead of the point. You're going to have legs that look like this. Okay, so that is a problem that you can pretty easily remedy, but it gets real close to that if you have it on this bowl that we started talking about earlier and that we actually have now. So what's one way that you could remedy this before you get to that point and you have to backtrack? Change the angle. So what you want to have is a leg that has, well, they're both going to come out perpendicular to the hip, okay? What you can do to prevent it from going up way too far and doing that, see that there is an acute angle where it comes out and hits that first angle right there. And it has an obtuse angle right there, okay? So you can flip-flop those, make this one an obtuse angle, this one an acute angle, and you will not have that problem. Okay, as long as you don't make that second section way too long, you won't have that issue. So as long as you do that, you'll be fine. Now, how do we actually figure out the angles? This is something that a lot of people were struggling with or at least needed a lot of guidance with. And sometimes to this day, it still confuses me depending on how complex I'm actually making the leg. So let's say I want to make a leg that looks like this, that comes out of the body like that. Okay, how would I decide how those angles are actually going to be made? Great question. <laughs> so this is the center line, and that's basically the angle that I want to make this. What you're going to end up doing is bisecting that angle. Okay, now you follow, following, yes. And bisect that angle. So what you might want to do figure out how long your actual section of your leg is. So let's just say that this again is the bowl. You are, is everybody following? If you need to record this, go for it. And that pretty much lines up really well because that brings this much of the leg into the body of the bowl, which is about how much we have. And let's just say that this is the center point where I want to cut that section. So I'm going to have to move it down a little bit. What I would want to end up doing is, can we see with my head in the way? I don't need that anymore, actually. Is holding this in place, okay, am I gonna be stepping right in the way right here? Okay, holding this in place and looking over it, you are going to draw a line directly across, copying this line that we draw in, drew in behind it that bisects that angle, okay? What that'll do is if you cut this, Flip it 180, it'll double that angle, and then it'll make it follow this path. Do you guys want to see? Yeah? Okay, okay. Uh, I'm not going to do the next one yet. So we have a bandsaw that's ready to go. Is that plugged in? No. But we can plug it in, right? How do I, is this to loosen the guard? I don't know. <laughs> oh. Wait, this is loose. Okay, here we go. Okay, and sometimes when you're cutting uh, round wood, it's smart to have a cradle, especially if you're cutting straight across the round wood, because that's where you have the most possibility that it'll start rolling and it'll catch and it might throw the piece or suck your fingers in, which is terrifying. But I've found that if you're cutting that diagonal, there's not as much of a chance that it'll roll because it'll roll maybe, but it'll roll kind of the wrong direction or it'll try to flip it up the wrong way. It's a little bit more supported if you're cutting a diagonal than if you're cutting straight across the round. Are we ready? Is this on? Okay, let's see if this worked. So, if my calculations are correct, and I have this cut, <laughs> thank you. I drop enough things that I've got a lot of practice. <laughs> so if my calculations are correct and I trace the angle properly while trying not to be right in your guys' way, 
this angle, when flipped, will match. Ho, 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 ho. Uh, hey. All right, so there are a couple ways that you can join these legs together. Do you guys want to see the other one, or do you guys get it? You want to see the other one? Okay, I'll show you the other one. Let me just get that angle right. So line this piece up to its original cut line, and I'm fortunate that this is actually a really good length for this. Line that to up to the original cut line if you want to put a piece of paper or a ruler and put it right to the edge to make sure that you have the line right. But you're really just laying the original one right on top of it. And then do the same thing with the other. Do that. And then because you have the second section of the leg, you're going to do the same thing, but you're going to push it up as far as you need to so that you can cut that same line. I might have gone a little bit over on one, but that can be easily fixed on a disc sander or a belt sander that you have something um, that you can uh, table for the belt sander or disc sander that you can actually just press it up very, very, very gradually. You don't have to hold it in the air and try to figure it out. So let me see real quick. Where did my tape go? I lost it again. Where did my brown tape go? Oh, wait, I found it. Hmm? My, oh, it is my walnut tape. Okay, and this is actually what I do before I start gluing or cutting the joints to reinforce them. And this will hold these pieces together. Oh, wait, I shouldn't have done that. What kind of tape is that? I don't know. My, I used to work in, um, when I was in college, I worked as a nanny on the weekends, a... I worked in the bookstore in between classes at my college, and I worked in the wood shop in between classes and at night. And when I was there, we had this tape, and my boss always just called it wood tape. I don't know if there's another name for it. Does anybody else know? 2515. Whatever that number is, it's got to mean something, right? OK. <laughs> you could tell us. <laughs> are we ready? Are we ready? Yes, so like these little model guys over here. Yeah. Yes, and that's actually where, that's why I start making these usually, is so that I can figure out exactly what angle I want it. So I would make, let's say I draw out my spindle, or I would trace my spindle, or all of the pieces of it, and I would cut that out out of cardstock, and I would try cutting it, flipping it, check to see if that's the angle that I want. If it's not, I put it back together, I put a piece of tape over it, cut a new angle, and then try it again until I decide which one I really like. And then I would take this piece of paper that's already to the size and shape that I need it to be and lay it right over top of the wood and just trace the final angle on the wood. Yeah? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. How, mu how am I doing on time? Pretty okay, sort of? Okay. Um, what I'd like to show you is two different techniques to reinforce the joints. Yeah? Have you ever tried doing the ball and socket joints? No, I have not, but I saw a couple ball and socket joints yesterday. 
and I think they're really cool. And I think that that would be a lot of fun if you wanted to just leave these joints ball and socket. Then you can either glue them into place and have them actually fixed at the angle that you'd like after you decide on it. Then you won't have to worry about these perfect little angles, but you'd have to f worry about fitting the ball to socket. Um, or you could leave them loose and have it as a little toy that you can actually play with the legs and make it do whatever you want and put it in whatever pose you want it for that day. So, no, I haven't, but I'd like to try. Yeah, I think it would be a lot of fun. Okay, so I need the mice. Uh, Steven, thank you. There are two different techniques that you can use. Actually, there's probably a ton of techniques that you can use, but these are two that one of them I use on a very regular basis, and the other one I just started using yesterday. Woo! <laughs> Can we see this okay? Yeah, okay. Oh, super secure. All right. Okay. So I'm going to show both examples on this leg just so that we can see it. All right, so the first one that we're going to talk about a little bit is the spline joint. And splines are typically used in box making and picture frames and legs in my case. But what it is for me is a piece of veneer that it's put in perpendicular to the angle that's cut so that we have grain support all the way throughout the leg. And that means that if I drop these legs, they are most likely not going to break, although I dropped a couple of them earlier and they didn't break even without the support. So I like to cut with my fancy dovetail saw. And again, I didn't start out with a dovetail saw, so this is an upgrade for me. I started with um, just a regular like 4 or $7 coping saw from somewhere that sells things really cheap. And what I did before I started this, and I did this um, just to show you the perfect angle that I got on this, or semi-great, uh, I taped it up so that the interior angle inside the leg matches. The outside doesn't match at all, but that's okay because I can easily just sand or carve that down later on. The important area that I'm not going to be able to get to is that inside angle. So that's what's important to match up before you start cutting your spline or doing whatever you need to do on it. The other method that we we're experimenting with yesterday. Let's see if this will work. Is what? Yes. Going to put a pin or a toothpick. If I could find my drill bit. Okay, we're going to pretend that we're putting a toothpick in it because I might have lost my drill bit. Oh, no, I didn't. It's in the shavings. How did I find that? Young eyes. Okay. One important thing about putting a pin in it. You can either pin and drill directly in on one leg and go straight into the other one, or you can do an entry and an exit where you start and angle it over so that it goes through to the other side. I think depending on how you want it, you could do one of each or just one. Well, let's see how this works. There we go. All right, so we've got a drill hole all the way through and one that pretty much fairly close uh, fits a toothpick and what I'm going to be doing is I'm just going to be showing you how to glue these up with CA glue today. Um, 
because, actually, I don't even have to. We could use a five-minute epoxy, but that's going to take forever to hold. But I will tell you now that I usually use, huh? Five minutes. Five minutes is a long time when I only have like an hour and a half. Or how long do I actually have right now? Not that long. Huh? An hour and a half plus. Minute. But it's five minutes, and I have to mix up like a different batch for each leg, so it's really 15 minutes. And I heard from somebody yesterday that five minutes is actually like 25 minutes before you can actually work with it. That's a whole other demo. <laughs> but I'm like done. <laughs> you guys are great. Oh, and this actually worked really well. Okay, so we have our toothpick a pin, I guess. That would that's what that would be. And we have our piece of veneer for the other leg. Ah. Uh, you know what? I don't make my own, and it is commercial veneer, but I don't know where it came from. Because another thing from my job uh, in the wood shop, I worked as a student work study, which is amazing because I got paid for going to the shop that I was in all the time anyways. And I just had to make sure that nobody did anything stupid. And it was a really fun job and I learned a lot. And my boss, when I was there, he knew that I wanted to be a woodworker on a more professional level. So every time something broke down, he'd be like, Rebecca, get over here. And he would show me exactly how to fix it by making me fix it, which was amazing because I learned a lot. And I'm a very kind of... Um, meticulous, kind of tedious type person anyways, even though I'm, obviously I lose everything constantly. But uh, my meticulous nature made sure that all of the joiner blades were always lined up perfectly and mixed, or mixed, sharpened really, really, really well, and everything was perfectly even. And our lathe um, tool rests were filed every week lightly to make sure that they were all amazing and wonderful. and. You know, everything just kind of worked out, and it, it was a really, really beneficial experience for me because I never would have gotten that if I didn't get the job there. This is medium. And I am flooding that interior surface, and that kind of is our goal. And the toothpick is just a support which if it doesn't totally flood the hole that the toothpick is in, um, after I snip or cut or sand the excess toothpick, I think I just adhered my finger to this. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> it happens all the time. Hmm? <laughs> No. <laughs> yes. Acetone and black rubber gloves are my friends. The black rubber gloves just scare some people sometimes. Especially when I snap them. <laughs> Exactly. You've got to have the laugh. Oh, goodness. Somebody want to grab the... Thank you. Okay. All right. So that one's awesome. Now, I've got a couple others that I'm going to glue up real quick just so that we get to see the finished product before I'm done that I already have pre-turned. And who knows if they're actually cut at the right angle, but this is something really important that I would show you. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, and I'm missing one. I've got nine different pieces for three legs, all right? Can, can you see on the video what I've done to them? What have I done to my legs? I have numbered them. <laughs> and that is crucial because sometimes you want to have um, the grain well, it's going to end up being flipped anyways, but you want to actually have the color of the wood line up to each other. So if you have them numbered and you have three separate spindles that you're turning, can you be my accelerator person? 
If you've got three separate spindles that you have turning and you just want to make sure, hold on, make sure that all three of them are the right wood, then that's all you really have to do. Now, these aren't numbered because these are all separate pieces anyways, so all I need to do is glue number two to whatever one I want. Because I tried to make them as similar as I could. And I'm just trying to flood both sides so that I get a little bit of squeeze out. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's good. You could do that too. And typically I do it with a um, five minute or um, West Systems epoxy. Because West Systems isn't as brittle as other epoxy sometimes do get. It gives it a little bit more of a give and I think it has a longer life. Uh, because it's marine grade epoxy or adhesive or finish, I guess. I don't know what they even use it for. It's a finish, right? What is it? <laughs> if they don't line up, like if the ellipse doesn't line up to the other ellipse, I'll usually just take a um, my carving tools, or if I can just easily just sort of shave some of it off with a utility knife, I'll do that first before I actually return a new piece. But it all just depends on um, the piece or how badly it actually lined up. But what I'll do is make sure that with my five minute epoxy or my West Systems epoxy, that um, I'll make sure that I'm covering both faces that are being glued together. I'll try to force some of the glue into that kerf from the saw so that I can have glue where the spline is going to go and I'll coat both sides of the spline that's going in so that I make sure that there is coverage everywhere before I, before I assemble this thing. These are very different, so I'm gonna just keep doing the other third one. There we go, thank you. For the splines or for the pins? Oh, 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 you mean do like different section, different species for each section of the leg. I, I haven't done that, but I've played with um, doing different finishes like paint or um, ebonizing just part of it. But I haven't really done different species altogether. But that is something that I'm might end up doing eventually. They're, they're actually, you know what, no, I'm lying. There's one table that I did that at the top part of the table, the table itself is walnut. The first section that comes down from the table is walnut. The second section is walnut. And then this one's actually four sections. So then walnut, walnut, a mixture of walnut and spalted maple, and then all spalted maple. So it sort of blends from one wood to another, but I also wanted to sort of make that animalistic to sort of domestic object transition a little bit more evident because the animalistic, or at least more natural of the spalted maple or more nature-like of that kind of nature taking over the form, that's where I had that transition as well. Huh? How do you like it? Oh, it looks great. I love it. I still have it. It's really hard. I, I tend to keep a lot of my stuff because I fall in love. I bet that doesn't happen to anybody else. Nope. Right? No, of course not. Where's that bowl that I drilled the holes in? Did the bowl that actually has the holes drilled in it that I think I passed around after I drilled them. Thank you. See, I knew it wasn't me this time. Okay. <laughs> Okay, are you ready? No, I don't, I don't, I need a table. Can I go all the way over there for my grand reveal? So then you always, you have to make sure that that end is a half, about four and a quarter inch. Yeah. So you have to be really good at eyeballing. Where am I going? Or is there somewhere else that I can set it? Can I put it on the ground? Okay. Are we ready? OK. 
Can we all see? Are we excited? <laughs> yeah? Huh? Ha! Ta da! <laughs> I'm, I'm done if you guys don't have any questions. Ask away. I'm an open book mostly. So to get your little uh, mm -hmm. just keep grinding until you get that shape you want. Yeah. Have you ever heard, have you ever heard the, the question, how do you um, carve an elephant out of marble? Just start chipping away everything that doesn't look like an elephant. Yeah, you just carve everything that doesn't fit into that little circle that I had drawn out and try to smooth over that transition from the wall of the bowl down through into the bottom while keeping that pretty, pretty consistent on that level. So there's, you can see on there that just everywhere that's not that circle and then eventually you'll end up softening that edge anyways and blending this side into the bottom of the bowl too. So you might want to transition into a smaller carving tool and just get that transition so that it just transitions smoothly into one. Okay? Yeah? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you.